Hello and welcome to Rapid Tabletop, my name is Leonard, but you can call me Leo. This will be my first video for my patrons. They have made a vote and this time around they want me to make a video of how I paint my terrain, the techniques used and paints I use. I am a little bit delayed with this uh, video upload here and I'm sorry for that. And that's because I did think I was going to make a different video uh, looking at the results from my Patreon page. It was looking like it was going to be a video about how to build a settlement tile, but in the last few hours or last day, it turned around and it became a video of which paints and techniques I'm using when I'm painting. But the good news is, is that I have already recorded all the clips for the next video, the one with the settlements. So that one will be coming quite shortly after this one, I hope. This video is a little bit interesting to make because my techniques and my methods, they change all the time. Every three months or so I find a new technique or a new brand of paints, new tools that I want to use. So it's a little bit hard to really put the finger on how I paint exactly. But all the tiles I've been doing this year during the pandemic has been roughly with the same techniques and that's what I'm gonna focus on in this video. And with that, do take everything I say in this video as a general advice. As I myself take a lot of inspiration and information from different sources. YouTube, Instagram, tutorials on the internet somewhere. I'm always trying to evolve and find new techniques. So use whatever you can from my information that I'm giving to you and don't get stuck on that's the only way to paint or build. Try to find other sources that suits your needs and your techniques. But before we start, I do want to mention how I'm going to make this video for you. So instead of showing how I paint a whole tile here, which would be quite cumbersome and quite hard to explain all the single things here on the tile, I will instead use small parts instead, representing the whole big tile in the end. Instead of using a whole tile and a huge wall section, well this one is not that huge, but it's a little bit bigger and there's a lot of complex things on it. And of course what I usually have, objects of some kind. It could be a barrel, it could be a furnace or something, but I usually have divided my things into three parts, tiles, walls and objects. So instead of having those big ones, I'll be using this one as a tile and for small objects I have a little crate and a little wall here. And to represent the columns and walls I have just taken a normal column here, it's no big difference here. And for objects I've used this little support beam here. And I chose this one because I think it's quite interesting, it has a lot of details and I can show a lot of things that uh, concerns contrast paints with this one here. First let's take a look at the tools that I'm using when I'm building and painting. Most of my tools come from Games Workshop. The cutter, the saw, the drill, the knife and of course my favorite, the mold line remover. But you can use any tool you want and any brand. But these are the ones that I'm using and they work perfectly fine for what they're intended for. Then of course we need something to assemble our miniatures and that is of course plastic glue and super glue. I mainly use plastic glue. Super glue I only use when there's some resin parts or metal parts which is very seldom when it comes to Games Workshop. But now for the actual things that I use for painting. I have two airbrushes. The top one is the Harder and Stanbeck, and the second one below that one is a uh, Air Viper from Mig Jimenez. I think it is a Badger brand. It doesn't really matter which brand of airbrush you use, there's no superior one among the top brands. You should use the one that you feel comfortable with, and it's kind of hard to know which one you would feel comfortable with. So before you buy an airbrush, if you don't own one already, make a lot of research on YouTube and online. YouTube is, according to me, one of the best sources and helped me a lot to decide which airbrush to get. And after the airbrush, of course, we go into the actual brushwork. So you need some brushes for this. And again here, there are so many different brands and 
you just get the ones that you feel comfortable with there's no real one way to go but for me i do love to use the windsor newton series 7 but when it comes to terrain i actually mostly use the shade brush the large and medium one from games workshop and as you can see here also i also have some makeup brushes and these are for dry brushing and then a very old used up brush and this one is for the texture paints and speak of the devil here it is the texture paint this is the one that i use almost all the time when it comes to terrain you don't need to buy this if you don't want to of course you can actually make one yourself just mix pba glue with some gravel sand and whatever you need but i'm lazy and i actually do like the texture of this one and it dries quickly and i can use it directly for metallics i use the one from uh, vallejo and i actually have found a way to use it and be in more control now and i'll talk about that a little bit later on but now i'm actually warming up to the uh, metallics for the airbrush with vallejo one thing i didn't mention here is actually i use primers and uh, the first base coat with from vallejo and it's ghost gray and of course a black one and i will show you the ghost gray later on and these four colors wait a bit um five colors are the most common ones that i use when i paint my terrain hull red from vallejo bone white gory red and yeah the one from me Jimenez, i can't really decipher so i actually have to look this one up but i think it is rs641 green something and the last one is light rust moving on to my favorite ones the contrast paints these are the usual ones that i use on my terrain and the ones that i need to have a steady flow of Agar's Dunes, Gorgrunta Fur, Plague Bearer Flesh, Leviathan Blue, and Balis Balisiconum Grey. Jesus Christ, that's a long word. I will show you later on how I use these different colors and where I apply them. Moving on to the secondary colors I use on the contrast range. We have a Snakebite Leather, Blood Angels Red, Yandan Yellow, Militarum Green, a Ferramic... A fer a Ferramatic Blue. A Ferramatic Blue. Yeah, that's it. And Talasar Blue. These I use for different things, different effects, lights, military equipment, and plasma coils. And the snake bite leather I actually use for gold details. And not to forget, something very important with especially with contrast paints is some kind of medium. And I use different kinds of medium for my contrast paints, and of course contrast medium and then I use glaze medium. Airbrush thinner is for of course the airbrush paints and I do use different mediums for my airbrush as well. Not shown in the picture is the airflow improver which I also use as a thinner. And of course the classical one Agrax Earthshade and Tyrant Skull from the dry paint range. Agrax Earthshade I have a lot of and lastly, but not least, I've actually switched over to use Kleenex as a paper for drying my brushes and especially my airbrush. And some mixing pots, very important to have for me at least. The first step in painting is something that is not really painting and that is preparing the miniature. The more you clean the miniature and the parts from mold lines and other parts that you don't want on the part or miniature, the easier it will be later on when it comes to painting. Today the Games Workshop kits are not that horrible when it comes to mold lines, they are actually very good. But this one here is a perfect example where you need to do a lot of cleaning. Here you can see the long vertical mold lines running through the whole support beam. This one needs to go, as well as these injection points. Just use your mold line remover from Games Workshop and it's easy peasy. Here we have a fully assembled tile. As we can see there's also all these black spots or actually the texture paint. This is one of the steps I do in the preparation stages. But painting it like this is very bulky and cumbersome. So that's why I always divide them into three parts. As mentioned before, three parts is usually what I do, and that is tiles, walls, and objects. Painting them sub-assembled makes it much easier to paint and I can reach odd angles with ease. First off, I want to show you where I place my texture paint. 
As you can see here, I am indicating here that I'm going to use an airbrush. And when painting really fast, you will have an overspray at some locations. When it comes to what I call objects, like crates, barrels and some minor shields and barricades, you will get an overspray in most cases, or in many cases, onto the floor tile. To avoid this, I sheet a little bit. Yeah, I'm not ashamed of it. But if it works, it works, and if it's fast, I'm happy. So I place the texture paint close and, yeah, basically on the objects and on the floor tile around the object, as indicated here. When I spray and do mistakes or overspray the object, it comes onto the texture paint instead of the floor tile. In later stages, this is very easy to fix. Just load up the airbrush with some brown paint, simulating the dirt and then you spray on to the dirt or the texture paint. And if you get a, an overspray this time onto the tile or onto the object like the crate in this, for this example, it doesn't really matter, it just adds to the weathering effect. Before moving into the actual painting here, I do want to mention one or two things. I did not record the base coat of black because I figured you know how to do that, just cover it completely from all angles. Secondly, I am struggling again with my airbrush. I did a deep clean or what I think was a deep clean. But you will see, especially now when I'm spraying with the first coat of grey here, there's no paint coming out, I'm struggling, I'm forcing paint out of it. And that's due to the paint is very old and it's been, yeah, it's clogging up so to speak. So in later stages it will be better but bear with me in the beginning it's gonna be a bit messy. Spraying on the base paint you can do that with a primer from a rattle can or like I do or many other painters through the airbrush. And if you do it for an airbrush and actually with a rattle can for that matter use gloves. Moving on to Vallejo Ghost Grey. Before I add some paint into my airbrush, I actually use a mixing pot first and pre-mix the paint. Adding thinner as needed, checking the consistency and if I'm not as satisfied, I add more thinner or more paint. After the first overpass, I move over the pieces again and making an initial highlight. Using the same color but just moving over the area once or twice, intensifying the color that is already there. Usually I want to finish all the airbrush work at once and then just move on to the brush work, but when it comes to this grey color I want to alter the hue a little bit, so I actually go over to some shades here. Here you can see a pot of contrast medium, well, it's actually a pre-made mix of Leviathan blue and contrast medium. But as you can maybe see here, it's running low, it's only one third left. So when I'm running low, I always make a new badge, mixing the Leviathan blue with contrast medium, checking the original pot color and comparing the new batch that I have made. Any leftover paint will be poured into the pre-mixed bottle here. And I do prefer doing it this way instead of having recipes and five drops of this and two drops of that because... And I do prefer doing it this way. There's a couple of reasons to it, but the main reason is that I had some previous experience when I had a recipe for making a, yeah, contrasted bluish thing here. I got a batch that was either good or worse, I don't know which way it was, but it had less pigment. So when I added my recipe of five drops of this and one drop of the Leviathan blue, it didn't turn out the same way as I wanted. So I always have a master pot, as I call it, and when it's running low, running down to one third or one quarter, I will start making a new batch, shaking it like I have done here, and then I will just pour in the rest into the pot. In this way I will always get something that is very close to what I already have. 
as usual, making tons of mistakes when I'm recording my videos. I should have used a larger brush when I'm doing the tiles. I always do that, but since this tile was so small, I didn't really reflect on that, so I just used a small brush, and you can really see all the brush strokes. So use a large brush and you will avoid most of these brush strokes. As you can see here when I'm painting the column instead I switched over to a larger shading brush. Thus I actually removed much of the brush strokes appearance on the surface. And as you can see also here I'm actually putting on a good amount of contrast paint here and I'm just going to show you that it doesn't really matter at this stage because you can actually just pick it up with a brush and move it away. Now before moving into painting with the metals I actually want to go through a few things. I mainly use only one metal color when I paint over the metal areas and that means bronze, gold, various types of metals. You can do as you please but for me this is a very fast method of just using one medium metal color, dual aluminum for this one in this instance, and just paint all the metals in that color. And later on I will modulate them into different kinds of metal. But it's all up to you how you want to paint of course. But this works for me and speeds up my process when it comes to mass painting a lot of terrain. On to painting metals. So in a previous video I complained a lot about having problems with painting with metals through my airbrush. And my main issue with the Vallejo range is it's a little bit too fluid, so it just runs through the airbrush so quickly. But after watching a couple of videos and getting some deeper understanding on how different mediums and thinners work, the airbrush flow improver doesn't really improve the flow. It, yeah, it's a lot of science into it, and chemicals and stuff. I'm not going to go into that part, but... I found out if I add this into my mix, it actually became a little bit more thick and it didn't run through the airbrush as quickly, which made me have more control when it came through the airbrush. So instead of a flow improver, it was a flow deprover, I guess. Moving on, and uh, as you can see here, the colors and the brightness is a little bit off and that's because I put my camera on the incorrect settings here so I'm sorry about that and I will correct that in the next video but putting on the metals here is not a big issue just do it from a 45 degree angle so you will get some natural shades and of course I find everything that needs to be painted in metals so inside of this crate we have a perfect example there's some grenades some ammunition and some glass packs also, something I didn't catch on uh, camera here is the barricade here. There are some metal parts on it and I actually painted those as well. I did say I only use one metal color, but for the lights I actually do use a chrome or a silver. And this is because I really want it to shine through. You can barely see it in the video here, but there is a slight difference and it is shinier in appearance. Now here's something that is new for my painting technique. Nothing I have used ever before on my terrain and that is inks from Liquitex. These have very good coverage and naturally transparent in most cases. Well the white one here is fully opaque. But the good thing here from my experience from the inks, they are very smooth and put very nice layers. And I'm gonna convert more and more into inks instead of acrylics. And why I use it in this video is because I did forget to uh, pre-shade or pre-highlight the barricade here. So the brown color that I'm gonna add on didn't have much of an effect. So I went into my ink bottles here and thought I'll give it a try and see what happens. And as you can see here, with the pre-shade with the ink, you get a very nice transition from the dark to the light. And for me at least the inks actually gave me more control to uh, modulate these effects. Moving on to paint all the objects, like here it is the crate. And of course you will have other things on your terrain like barrels and other barricades and crates. Moving on to the column and walls. I paint all the panels with this whole red. Not shown in this video, uh, I did actually pre-shade a little bit more because I had some more 
of this ink mixture in my airbrush. So I, I went through the columns just to see how it reacted onto the column panels. This process is a very long one when it comes to tiles because you will have a lot of walls and of course a lot of panels to paint. Next up I mix my bone white with some thinner and again check it so everything is okay and then I move on to painting the panels. I pass through the panels two times adding two thin coats to have more control of the modulation of the color. Time to paint some objects. I start off with the red ones because I mostly have red details on my terrain. Using the gory red from Vallejo I mix it up with some thinner. Here on the barricade you can actually clearly see the effect of the uh, yeah, sketch or whatever you call it that I did with the ink. Transitioning from the black, brown and into red and then some very bright red in the middle. Then of course you just move on to different objects that you're going to paint red. Next step I add some light rust into my uh, gory red to make it a little bit brighter, mix some some thinner and then I proceed on to spraying some extreme highlights. In hindsight I actually added a little bit too much thinner, getting overly excited about this thinner bottle that I just got. But with all the extra thinner I actually had to go through the terrain piece one or three times to get the desired effect but I did have full control of the layers and that's a good thing if you have time for it of course and you can modulate the color step by step layer by layer. Now something I do quite often is that I save the paint that I have been using in my mixing pot and in this instance this color is very similar to rust and of course I wanted to use this later on when I'm doing my weathering step so I just put a lid on it and then I will you come back to this paint later on. Time for some green, the same procedure here as with the red one. Mix it up and spray it onto the objects that are going to be painted green. As you can notice here, I really don't care if I hit the floor tile here. You can see that it's already picked up some brown from the previous layer. And I'm not scared of it because I have the texture paint there protecting the floor tile. Well, it's not protecting it, it's just covering up for future mistakes. And as with the red one, I use the light rust here to make a more vibrant or yellowish green. And each time I make this highlight from greens or reds, I use different colors. Sometimes I use a bright yellow, sometimes I use a white or skin color. I don't know, I experiment a lot. And I do recommend that you do that too and find the settings that you like and not just go by hard recipes and five drops of this and two drops of that other color. Find your own and make it work for you. But here you see how I mixed my green color to make it a little bit brighter, so feel free to use that if you want to. Now I'm going back here to the whole red and I'm adding a little bit extra of the uh, thinner. And this is because I don't want full coverage when I'm going over this step here. I want a little bit to shine through, uh, it's hard to see in the video of course, but but now I'm going to spray the uh, texture paint. So with the thinner added it will not give a full coverage. It will be a little bit transparent when it hits the crate and the floor. Showing the previous color underneath. And there you have it. All my mistakes that I have been doing with the green and the browns is now covered up with a texture paint and some brown paint. And this little weathering technique I read in a white dwarf I think or somebody sent me an article about it. And I actually do like it, it's just normal tap water and a lot of it. And then on top of that you just add Agrax Earthshade. As you can see it's a very fast step and no real skills is needed and actually the less skill you have the better the result. And now we're going to paint the panels. Again I have a pre-mixed uh, pot here with Agaras Dunes and Contrast Medium. But for this video I will actually make a new mix so you guys can see how I make this mix. 
And as I said before, there's no exact scientific measurements that I'm using. I just pour in some contrast medium and then I add a brush with some contrast paint on it. And then I cross check so the color is the same. And well, this time it actually happened that I got the mixture correct. But as you could see, I did not use any measurements like drops or anything like that. I just poured in some contrast medium, took my brush, dipped it in the agar's dunes and then mixed it. And this is the way that I prefer to do it. If you have your own way of calculating drops and using measurement tools or whatever you want, that's fine by me, whatever gets you the end result that you want. There is no wrong way of painting except not painting. Now adding this new mixture onto the panels, I'm using the medium sized shade brush. I could have used a larger one, but then I would be uh, hitting the blue panels or blue walls here. So I will get some brush strokes, but that's quite okay. It can add some grime effects, but in the end I'm going to dry brush this with a Tyrant's Gold color and most of those strokes will disappear. And just for show, after I'm done, I have some paint left. I put it into my pre-made mixing pot. Before moving on, I want to talk a little bit about the contrast paints and how I exactly use them with different materials. So I talked before about the metals and how I will modulate them into different colors. And that's what I'm gonna do here now. So why cut to me and not just talk while the video is running? Well, because I want to look smart and show my face. But the contrast paint do have some qualities that I love and I know there's a lot of painters out there still, but not as many as before, that actually think the contrast paint is not a real painting method. I do urge you to try it out if you're not one of those who have tried it. It has a lot of nice properties. If used correctly, you will actually get very nice results. You should not always just use it from the pot. As you have seen me here in the video now, I'm mixing it with a contrast medium and you can actually use glaze medium, which I do a lot and you will get nice effects from it. So what I want to say about the contrast paint is that they are actually very high on pigment, but they're still transparent. And that's very good in the next steps that we're gonna do here when painting over the metals. That means when I paint over the metal here, the metal will still shine through. So you will get a metal red or a metal blue and in this case I'll modulate the metals into looking like bronze, gold or a darker metal, darker metal, sorry. And in later stages I will over the chrome that I painted also, I will uh, modulate them into looking like lights. So the first one I always do is Gorgon da Fur. And painting over a metal like Dura Aluminum, it will give an illusion of bronze. And if you do think it's a little bit too strong, the bronze effect or the contrast paint in general, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, just dilute it with a contrast medium or the preferred medium that you want to use. And for the next step here, I will actually do that and dilute it a little bit or quite a lot because it's high on pigment with some contrast medium. I'm not sure if you can see it in the video clip here, but there's actually a quite big difference between the two different bronze effects. So moving on to uh, four colors, I guess. I'm getting lazy here now. All right, Palisicanum, or Palisicanum Gray Snake Bite Leather, Plague Bearer Flesh and Blood Angels Red. Starting off with a Snake Bite Leather to get a gold effect. You can use different versions of uh, the contrast paint, giving different hues of gold. Agar's Dunes, Skeleton Horde and I think even Nastrig Yellow you can use to get different kinds of yellow. The Nastrig Yellow is a yeah, very bright yellow gold of course. Basiliconum Grey, mmm, got it right. So with this one I want to modulate the metal that is already existing there, but making it a darker metal. Balisganum gray is... God damn it, I got that wrong. All right, anyway, this gray color I do prefer over the 
Black Templar contrast because the Black Templar contrast is really strong and actually just makes it black. With this one I can still keep the shine, the metal shine and in the recesses it will become very dark, a shade. Moving on to Plague Barrier Flesh. This one I usually use on my lights. Painted on top of a chrome color or silver color, it really shines through. Sadly, I'm not sure it shows that clearly on a video, but on the terrain pieces on themselves in real life, you can really see it. And as usual, if it's a little bit too strong and it's not shining through enough, just thin it down with some contrast medium. Blood Angels Red? Well, again here, I usually use this one for... Um, lights but you can also use it for panels like here inside the uh, gauges and you can actually paint the cables here which I'm doing now and yes it might look a little bit strange when you have metal cables and then you have some red contrast paint so it might look like it's shining but later on you will be using another shade on top of this and it will remove a little bit of that effect so multiple colors again Militarm Green, Gorgrunta Fur, and Skeleton Horde. Using the Gorgrunta Fur for the casings of the ammunition. It takes a little bit of time to do it this way, but luckily you won't have that many crates that are open. And the few ones that you have open, you can actually take your time to do this. It doesn't take that long, approximately one minute or less. Then I move on to painting the uh, bullets with Skeleton Horde. And lastly, I used the Militarm Green to paint the Lascand ammo pack and the grenades. And here we have it, the color that most of us have on their shelf, Agrax Earthshade. This one I just slab on all over the place, not really caring if it hits some other parts that's already painted. It will just add on to the weathering effect. As you can see from the white paper I have on the background, there's a lot of excess paint coming onto it. And that's because I'm quite rough when I'm painting with this Agrax Earthshade. So don't be afraid to use it, because it will just add on to the weathering effect when it comes to terrain. Once the Agrax Earthshade is almost completely dry, I like to go over it with some rust colors. And this is because I want them to mix a little bit. I add a little bit of glaze medium to get a different consistency on this mixture that I have here. And then I just add it on to the miniature itself. This is nothing that I had prepared ahead of time and it changes for each video or each time I make a terrain piece. Best thing is of course if you have something that is pre-made and that you can use all the time. But I do like to use my paints that I have been using previously on the terrain. Like the red highlights with this uh, yellow and light rust. And not wasting the paint and reusing it onto the terrain. It also gives a secondary effect because it actually binds the colors together. And now for the last step. Dry brushing. I do love dry brushing, it's a very nice and simple technique and it adds a lot of contrast and much needed weathering effects. Here you can see me really going hard onto the panels to get rid of those brush strokes. And as you can see here as well, I'm actually dry brushing every single thing with the Tyrant Skull. And that is because I want one uniform color that binds all the colors together and that will be the Tyrant Skull in this case. So it's a more smooth transition from, for example, the green to the blue. Here I'm waving the large makeup brush in front of you. And that's because I want to tell you that on a full scale tile, the 12 by 12 inch tile, you're not gonna move around with that small dry brush that I'm using but you will move on to a larger dry brush and even the metals get a dry brush of this tyrant skull and the reason is the same here as before just to tie it down with the other colors that I had and also it adds to the weathering effect and there it's done and here I'm trying to piece them together which it's kind of hard when they're all loose so instead of that here's some pictures now these Three small pieces might not look so impressive by themselves, but if you take a look at this train piece here, 
is the same techniques used, but in a larger scale. If we zoom in here to different parts here, for example the staircase, it has some light rust onto it, but it's just the metal paint, basiliconum grey on top, and then of course the light rust. You can even notice there's some texture paint to break up the smooth surface. Moving on to the water container here. Here you can see that I use Balisaconum Grey to make it a little bit darker. Looking at this pile of junk here, you can see it's just the different colors that I always use. Red, green and various types of metals. And not to make them stick out too much and make a mess on the tile, texture paint is all around the pile of junk. And finally we can see here the walls and the panels, they're painted in the same way. The blue grayish tones and the bleached bone panels. So I hope that made some sense and as you can see those three small pieces might not look so impressive but make it in a larger scale like with a big terrain piece it all adds up and becomes a more appealing look to it. I do hope that you can use some of the information I've been using here in this video. And in future videos, of course, I'll be painting uh, larger terrain pieces like this one here. And I will be doing step by steps. But they will not be, of course, as explanatory like I did here with uh, how I mix and everything. I will just explain I use this paint, mix with that paint and that's it. And as usual, if you do like the content, do leave a subscribe and a like and of course furthermore if you want to support me even more you can head over to my patreon page and help me out there and as a patron you will be the one deciding which videos I'll be making and uploading here on YouTube like this one for example this one was one of the requests of the patreons and I will be doing that at least once a month or try to at least and I will make an, a request for the patrons and asking them what kind of video they want me to make. But that's it for this time, so I'll see you in the next one, alright?